morning, Lionhearts. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. If things look a little bit differently today, it's because I put on that new wide angle lens on this camera to try it out. I think it looks pretty good. Um, come to find out, that was from my mom for my birthday. That was one of my birthday presents. They just forgot to include a name. So thank you, mom, and thank you to my stepdad for sending this. This has been a nice addition because uh, it's always been one of my complaints with this camera is that it's not wide enough. So maybe um, I won't have to use this all the time, but for capturing buildings and traveling, it's for me, it's kind of essential. So we're going to go out. We have a full day. We're going to take Jaw to the park and, uh, and then I'm going to go show you um, where a crazy real event happened. <laughs> and then tonight I want to go check out once upon a time in Hollywood, it's uh, in 35 millimeter up at the Arclay Center Amadome, and what better way to see it? Scott Michaels is thanked in it on the uh, in the same list of credits with Adam West and Burt Ward. So I was like, that's so cool. I went to a barbecue. Um, it dearly departed last night, and they were kind of talking about the movie, and I was the only one that hadn't seen it. So I said, you know what? Let's go see it today. Days with Jordan the Lion begins now. So I decided to bring us out to the park today where. Uh where they did that scene from Say Anything with him holding the boom box out here. And this is also where Pee Wee Herman has the, uh, gets chased by the kids on the bike. Since the uh, dogs haven't really been playing that much out at the park, I figured we might as well just come to an actual park and let him roam around the grass. So I heard kind of a funny story recently that George Hamilton told and that kind of inspired the vlog for today. So today's vlog is actually about a man who uh, captured the world's imagination in the late 60s and 70s by being a stuntman, jumping over uh, strings of semis, jumping over Caesar's Palace Fountain. Today we're going to talk a little bit about Evil Knievel. Yeah, and exactly right here is where the car was parked. Lloyd Doppler's got the boombox playing in your eyes. You can see the picnic tables, different picnic tables, but right there. So how Evil Knievel really got his start was he was a, a good talker. He was a con man early on in his life, but he was um, a salesman and he was selling motorcycles and was looking for some way to get people in to want to buy a motorcycle. So he decided to jump a bunch of snakes and cougars and um, it turned into a total fiasco. But what he realized was not only did people love seeing whether he would make it or not, but people came up to him afterwards saying, what are you gonna do next? And that pretty much inspired his entire career. Didn't take long for him to move out to Hollywood and talk someone into investing in his ideas, investing in him to create these fantastical jumps and getting people out there to see him. <laughs> Making a buddy. <laughs> Actually, this is great. He's running into a lot of dogs out here, walking off leash. Hi. Now he's happy. Now he's happy. Plenty of attention. So unfortunately his time in Hollywood wasn't a success, but he was really gifted with talking and what he decided to do was the wide world of sports was pretty popular. He started calling one of the main bookers in Vegas and he started um, pretending to be other news outlets asking for, hey, you guys, do you have Evil Knievel, anything with Evil Knievel coming up? Or he would mess up the name and, uh, but just make it close enough to where this guy, you know, getting all these calls would not forget the name. And so he talked them into investing in him. They put him on Wide World of Sports. His jump was um, successful. He jumped over a bunch of, believe um, it was a bunch of semis. Um, and that was successful. And then he decided to jump over Caesar's Palace Fountain. And Evil Knievel was also really famous because he was really great at merchandising himself. Oh, he found squirrels. <laughs> yeah, he was really good at merchandising himself. And his toy, where you could wind up and release Evil Knievel to go do tricks on a motorcycle, was the fastest selling toy of its time. Unfortunately, the Caesar's Palace jump wasn't successful and he crashed. But one thing he knew was he said, I know people don't necessarily want to see me die, but if I crash, they don't want to miss it either. So he knew that that was the case and, and he knew that putting his life in jeopardy was worth it to him because of that. Um, he was seriously injured by this, 
but it made him very, very famous, and that piece of footage, um, they captured his jump and him tumbling and rolling afterward, and it just became so um, played that George Hamilton saw it and decided, you know, maybe there needs to be a movie about Evil Knievel. And that kind of is what our vlog is about today. The conversation that George Hamilton and Evil Knievel have, what happened, how it all came about, and how it affected George Hamilton and Evil Knievel's, Knievel's career. You didn't get the squirrels, did you? You didn't get them. Now, it was basically all George Hamilton's idea. Evil Knievel wasn't looking for anyone to make a movie about him, and if he was, he probably would have wanted to star in it, but George Hamilton was kind of a matinee idol. He was kind of, uh, you know, they were presenting him as, you know, a good-looking guy and a teen heartthrob and everything, but he wanted to do something with a little bit more grit to make him look a little bit more macho, and so he had seen the footage of the Caesar's Palace jump, and he decided, you know, that's, that's what I need to do next and so he enlisted uh, the man who wrote Dirty Harry and Apocalypse Now to write the script. Oh wow, take a look at this tree. That's nice. This is kind of nice. They have a flagpole and a memorial and everything. A little sitting area over here. Oh, it's a 911 memorial. In loving memory of the Californians lost on September 11th, 2001. What a great sentiment. I'm waiting to see how long it takes Jaw to realize that squirrel's right there chewing on that. He's not gonna see it by peeing on everything. The squirrel's looking at Jaw. There he goes. He's having all kinds of fun out here. We might have found a new hangout. He can chase squirrels, run into other puppies, play around on open land whenever he wants. Evil Knievel prided himself on being afraid of nothing and being tough as nails, so that was something that they definitely had to incorporate into the script. However, George Hamilton probably had no idea that he would get a real life experience when he brought this script to Evil Knievel. That's a little strange. Somebody just abandoned a motorized chair out here. can see the squirrel right there climbing up the tree. He's looking the wrong way. And yep, this is the section where Pee-wee's getting chased by those bullies on the bike. All right, we're cruising down Sunset Boulevard to get to the Saharan Motel. I am your rock. That's cool. Well, for years and years and years, this was known as the Saharan Motel. And it was known as this for so long that I didn't even know it had changed names. This must have happened within the last year or two. But it was here that George Hamilton was called to deliver the script of Evil Knievel's life, in which he wanted to portray evil. Now, like George Hamilton said, I didn't want to, um, you know, I don't think he was too keen on somebody stepping into his shoes and trying to put on his outfit and pretend to be him. But we had a great script and so I came here, he said it was kind of a gypsy motel and um, Evil was holed up in a room here nursing a big wound, and had a big wound on his leg from an injury and um, George said I walked in and I heard the crack of a wild turkey bottle open up and Evil drank half the bottle right in front of me and, uh, and George said, well, I, uh, I brought the script. I want you to, to read the script, see what you think. It's a really good script. And Evil said, you read the script. <laughs> and George said, well, I, I, uh, I have read the script. I, I love it. I think it's great. That's why I want you to read it. And um, Evil said, read it to me. And George said, I'm not going to sit here and read an entire full-length feature film script to you. That's just not going to happen. And he said, uh, Evil pulled a gun out on him, pointed it at his head, and said, read the script. <laughs> and uh, so George said, I sat here and I read the script all the way through. 
and he said, I probably gave the finest performance of my entire life here. I probably deserved an Academy Award because I was terrified. Now, like I said, Evil was a pretty serious guy, and uh, when he did interviews and everything, he was always dead serious, saying he wasn't afraid of anything, and George got a pretty good taste of what he was going to be playing right there. Now, George said, I'd never been so terrified in my life, and that would just be the tip of the iceberg with Evil Knievel. He would have run-ins with the Hells Angels throughout his career. He would, uh, he would get so mad at one of his old booking agents for, uh, well, basically, he told the booking agent that the guy could record um, their time together on a, a setting up the Snake River Jump, and the guy ended up keeping the recordings and then writing a book and even um, he said, you know, I didn't use the worst stuff that I, I could have used, but when the book came out, Evil was so pissed off because um, he said it was all lies that he found his former press agent um, walking through a, a courtyard, had two guys hold him down, and Evil Knievel beat the guy with an aluminum bat and went to jail for it. Um, and the, the, the really sad part is that Evil Knievel was just in denial. When they interviewed other people that had worked with Evil, that had read the book, they all said, yeah, not only was it factual, but that was probably like the, the nicer things that he could have published. I mean, there was a whole lot worse that Evil said that, that really could have defamed him. But of course, you know, like George was worried about, Evil didn't like somebody stepping into his uniform and portraying him, so he wasn't a fan of the movie. But George said, you know, we had such a great writer that, uh, that in the end, you know, they had written these great speeches that Evil would say before he would do these jumps. And, you know, Evil would always, in general, say something, you know, quasi-heroic anyway, but these were very, very well thought out, very kind of like historical-based, um, type motivations that he would he would say before he did it and he goes after the movie all of a sudden evil started doing that on a regular basis he kind of adapted that character um, that we had embellished as his even more of himself and whatever man that was inside of him he just became evil can evil um, 24 7 and adapt just became the character um, for the rest of his life and actually that's not totally fair because um, he was kind of known for a lot of his life being kind of a bad guy, but in the end he made amends with everybody. He apologized for everything he'd ever done and everyone ended up forgiving him. So um, so he wasn't he wasn't all that bad of a guy in the end. But before Evil Knievel there was just nobody like him. There was nothing like him and the name has went down synonymously for being you know, anytime anyone does anything crazy or being a daredevil, they are called Evil Knievel. Now right caddy corner to us, right over there is where the famous Amos headquarters was. So George Hamilton was almost killed across the street from famous Amos. I'm kind of lucky, a friend of mine is taking me out to eat for my birthday and um, they're letting me pick so I decided we're gonna go to Chinatown and go to my favorite Cajun place. Um, little Jewel of New Orleans. You guys will love this. You guys are coming with us. Here it is, the Little Jewel of New Orleans. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, this is the best. I love this place. So you look at the menu and then you order up here. All right, we both got the Catfish Po' Boy which is just amazing. And um, we're gonna share the crawfish mac and cheese here. Even though I trust the chef, I'm gonna put just a little bit of this uh, Creole seasoning on there. So I noticed when we were coming in, they had a filming sign. They're gonna be filming something here today. And I saw that they said something about like a show that had filmed here early on when the store opened, or the restaurant opened. So I think it's probably Guy Fieri and this table is now reserved, so we'll see. The food is awesome as usual. And while we were eating, I looked up and saw this and said, this is another reason I love this place. Elvis is King Creole. The food was amazing, but we're getting out of there before whatever filming's going on. I don't really want to be on any of those TV shows. All right, gang, I dig the new lens. I think it looks pretty good. And um, I'm gonna take off now, go to the Cinerama Dome, and uh, I'm gonna leave this camera here because I don't think they'd really want me taking a camera into a movie theater, but we'll show you the outside for my camera phone. And we're going with my old pal, Adam the Woo. So we're gonna go see the new Tarantino movie. And I am super excited because my friend Scott Michaels, who has taken us on those dearly departed um, Manson, Sharon Tate, uh, La Bianca tours, he was a consultant, a historical consultant on this. Now, not everything was he a consultant on, but a lot of the, the story and stuff he was, so should be cool. 
we're heading down Sunset Boulevard and this was one of the um, this is the original location of the Aquarius Theater and this is one of the things that they brought back to life for the movie we'll see if it's in the movie there it is the Cinerama Dome look at that classic sign Oh, that's classic. And here we have Hollywood Resident. Well, actually changed that. Today is the end of the Hollywood Residency. This is officially, keep it on the down low. I haven't told anyone except everyone that I will be leaving Hollywood. So this is kind of a historic moment. This is kind of the way to leave, isn't the it? Movie about Hollywood when I'm leaving Hollywood and going 40 miles south to make your Orange own once County. upon a time in Orange County. There you go. What is all this? Adam was thinking the same thing I was. Wow. And there, Quentin signed it. This is where they had the, uh, the premiere the other night. Look at that. Here we go. So far, we have an empty theater. This should be a blast. In Hollywood! <laughs> All right, the movie is over. I loved it. And they were giving away some freebies on the way out. Definitely a surprise ending that I did not see coming. I highly recommend this movie. Well, Adam, we have just seen movie number nine by Tarantino. He's yeah. claiming that he will only do ten total. What did you think? We, You and I both... Mentioned after the movie, we neither, we neither one of us ever watched previews or like... I never saw the trailer. Yeah, nothing, so... You can't really say too much if you don't want to give any spoilers, but right. uh, I was pleasantly surprised. It was amazing. I was surprised that I found myself laughing as much as I was throughout the movie. Yeah, definitely a, definitely a lot of laughs. Another Tarantino um, highlight to his career, man, for sure. It was one of my favorite newer Tarantinos, to be honest with you. I like the older Tarantino stuff, some of the stuff as it went along. Not as big a fans as the early years, but this is like one of my favorite newer Tarantinos. So you, you recommend people come see it? Yeah, definitely. I'll probably end up seeing it again, for sure. And as we're walking out of the theater, we see this, the Quentin Tarantino Hollywood sign. DiCaprio, amazing job. Absolutely amazing job. Good job, Rick Dalton. Yep, I absolutely love the movie tonight. Tarantino knocked it out of the park. And um, I also want to definitely mention DiCaprio, Brad Pitt, they were stellar. Kurt Russell, stellar. I, The performances in this were, for me it was next level. I'm already a fan of DiCaprio. I always think that for the most part he does a great job in whatever he's acting in. And this one was one that you just, I mean, you just love his character and Brad Pitt's character. They're just... They were just so well done. I think um, if you're hemming and hawing about, hey, should I go see this? Or maybe you weren't gonna go see this. I really, really recommend it. It's, uh, you know, when they, they announced the movie and everything, they said, it's two hours and 45 minutes. And Adam, under his breath, goes, oh man. And I said, hey, I heard that it flies by. And when the movie was over, we looked at each other and I go, it flew by to me. And he goes, yeah, it flew by to me. It really felt like an hour and a half. It's really, really a quick moving movie. So go check it out, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. All right, everyone. I want to thank Joseph Semenza, Donna DeBru, uh, Jen Fritzke, Gary Sparks, Wayne Schneider, Mark Davis, Paul Michaels, and Kevin Jinx for all becoming Patreons. Thank you all. I hope you enjoyed today's vlog. It was a little bit of everything, but... I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found something in there that was interesting to you. Have a great night and goodbye.